Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Sound for Video session. Great to have you here today, to this evening, or whatever time it may be, wherever you're at. Thanks for joining us. Let's hop on over to our agenda, and we will go ahead and get started. So first up, pretty simple agenda today. <laughs> um, first, our signal chain. We are using the same signal chain we've been using for several months now, actually. The Earthworks Ethos is my microphone that you see just here. That's going into the Rupert Neve Shelford channel, which is a preamplifier, um, EQ, compressor, and it also can add saturation, although we have that turned off. That's going line out into the camera here, which is a Canon C200. That combines the audio and the video, of course, and then sends it out to the A10 Mini. A10 Mini output via HDMI to a decimator cross converter. That's going out to the other room via an SDI cable to the Pearl Nano. That's encoding it and sending it to YouTube. So that's our whole signal chain for today. All right, with that, let's go ahead and jump into our questions. And I'm gonna go straight in here today. First up from Mark is, I went to record my band last night with the XF605. For those that are not familiar with that, that is a Canon professional camcorder um, and an NTG3 fitted and it has come out with some seriously clipped waveforms that I don't understand. I set it up so that channel one XLR in fed both channels one and two. Channel one was set manually at the sound check and channel two was set to auto as an experiment to see what I would get back. Channels three and four were the internal camera mics set to auto. As you can see from this screenshot, and I'll bring that up in just a second here, both internal mics are reasonable, but the NTG channels are both seriously clipped, even though they were well within acceptable gain levels. Channel one is the more interesting one here because it's well down and was set to about minus, uh, set for about a minus 12 dB peak in the camera. It feels like something is getting too much gain early on, but I don't know of any other controls. I'm sure this is something I'm misunderstanding or have set something wrong, but any pointers would be much appreciated. P.S. I also notice similar behavior with other mics, such as the Wireless Go 2, Sennheiser G4s, uh, so I'm 99% sure that it's all the camera. Okay, let me just show you the screenshot that he sent, and we'll take that to the full screen here. Okay, so channel one was the Rode NTG3 set uh, with its gain set gen um, manually. And it was tuned so that the peaks would come into about minus 12, which is about what it looks like there. However, it looks like all those waveforms are chopped off. Channel 2 is the same thing, same mic coming into input 1, but set to auto gain. And then channels 3 and 4 are the internal camera microphones set to automatically gain as well. Okay, so Mark, I think we can go back out to our uh, main shot there. I think what we're looking at here is... The NTG3, well, first of all, I'm assuming that this band is quite loud. <laughs> um, and I'm guessing that what, what is happening is that the output level of the microphone is so strong that it's, it's coming in like this. There may be a limiter in the camera as well. You might check for a limiter setting. It does look like there's a tiny bit. If I were to zoom in really closely, it looks like those waveforms may still have a tiny bit of dynamic range. You're not just completely flat chopped off. So it looks like there's a limiter or something perhaps in the camera that is engaging. That might be something to check as well. I don't think the NTG3 is really a great mic for recording loud bands, especially if you're going to be, I don't know what size the venue was, but especially if you're going to be close to those loudspeakers. I would probably use something else. You might also need a pad on the microphone to bring the levels down further. Um, so there's just a lot of different considerations there. It's hard to do it without being there and without having the camera there to to, to 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 adjust settings but what i would recommend is you might even try uh, well i would first look to see if there's a limiter setting in the camera on input number one and if so turn that off and then adjust your game um, so those are the first thoughts that i have if anyone in the chat has other um, advice for mark that would be really really helpful if you've used that camera before, for example, would love to know what insights you have. I don't have any firsthand experience with that micro with that camera, but um, that's that's my sense from what we can see here. So, hopefully, that makes sense. Okay. 
Um, auto gain is what we're seeing on channel two, but channel one was manual gain. So that's uh, that doesn't appear. I mean, there there's something else going on there too somehow. Um, oh, I, Linda says line out was too much from the mixer. Now, I don't know if the camera or the microphone was attached to the mixer. Um, I think the cam the microphone was attached directly to the camera. So that's what we're seeing here. This is all captured by the microphone that's attached to the camera. I'm pretty sure. So that would be another thing to check as well. Um, oh, Daniel says he has an XF705 and it does have a limiter. So Mark, definitely something to check there and see if that limiter is turned on. Might see if you can turn that off and then gain down some. Okay, fantastic. See what a see what a community can do. You have another one there. Two more. Uh, oh, a couple more. Matt says I used I used the camera. It's been a while. I don't think it has a compressor. Look like the mic was overdriven. Yep, could be. But again, he had set the gain so on yeah. input one. Mic was direct to camera. Okay, that's what I thought as well. Okay. Yeah. Check to see if there is a limiter in there, Mark. I think that's going to be that. That's what it looks like to me. Uh, what mics would you recommend for that situation? Um, oftentimes for recording music, small diaphragm condensers are generally preferred, especially something with a pad. If you're recording a really, really loud band, um, something with a PA system, <laughs> that they're really pushing hard in the venue. So um, I, you know, I have a set of Rode TF5s. Um, there's the NT5. There are Neumann makes a bunch. It depends on what you, you know, your budget and how much you want to spend. But normally they call them pencil condensers, but essentially small diaphragm condenser microphones that are not shotgun microphones. So they don't have the interference tube design on them. So that's typically what's used in recording uh, music there. And Mark confirms, yes, it was loud. <laughs> so hopefully that helps a little bit there, Mark. I'd, I'd take a look for that limiter setting and see if you can get that. Uh, tuned in there. Turn, turned off is the main thing that I would look for there. All right. Uh, next one from Mirko. When I record my audio, only spoken, then even in silence, I have an unpleasant noise in the background. Self noise. Is this hiss? And so to answer that first question, usually self noise does sound like hiss. Yes. In post, I can eliminate this noise in Isotope RX9. How do I get rid of it in a live production? Starting point, Rode Wireless Go, A10 Mini Pro, Mix Pre 3, two and obs microphones are the Rode lavalier go sennheiser hsp essential omni i assume that's a headset mic one of the little ones that hangs on your ears uh, t-bone head mic and a Rode hs2 which again is a headset mic i've tried different mics lavalier and headsets different rooms and connected the Rode wireless go once directly to the atem once via mix pre 3 2 and once directly to the computer the problem remains where does this hiss originate in the Rode Wireless Go, do I need another wireless system? If so, which one? All right. Uh, Self-noise can be generated anywhere in the signal chain. And I will just point to a couple of items there where I think it's most likely coming from. Microphones are the first place. So especially if any of the cables are compromised in any way. Um, it doesn't sound like, I'm assuming that's not necessarily the case, but you can never be 100% sure unless you try other things. It sounds like you're getting the hiss regardless. A10 Mini Pro's inputs are quite noisy. I will say that, so that's one I would avoid. Um, if you can take the microphone into the Mix Pre, you know, if you can actually get an adapter and just, just as a test at least, take the microphone directly into the Mix Pre 3.2 and record on the Mix Pre and see if you're still getting the hiss. Um, that would be the first thing I'd do. And then you can start adding things back to your signal chain. So then add the wireless system back and see if you're getting hiss. Then, you know, whatever configuration you want to do. So what I generally try to do is make the signal chain as simple as possible to eliminate as many potential sources as possible and make sure that you're getting clean, you know, a clean recording there. Then add something else to the signal chain, do another test, see if you're getting noise there. My guess is that the mix, it's, I don't know if you're going into the A10 Mini Pro, um, those mic slash line inputs are not the cleanest in the world. So that's one potential one. Rode Wireless Go is not the cleanest in the world. Um, so that's another potential one. The Rode Lavalier Go in particular is noisy. So that's probably introducing a good bit of hiss. Usually the microphones are more likely to introduce hiss than it would be, for example, something like the Mix Pre 3's um, preamplifiers. They're very clean 
So that's probably the microphones more likely. The Rode Lavalier Go in particular, I found to be quite noisy. Haven't used the Sennheiser headset, although Sennheiser generally makes pretty good microphones. So, And then the Rode HS2, I would expect to be uh, relatively clean. Again, I haven't used that one for sure, but um, generally the, the self-noise spec on lavaliers and headset mics is a little bit higher than you can get on some other mics. So it sounds like you have to have a headset or a lavalier and wireless. If so, um, anyway, th there's a strategy that I would approach it with, and that will help you find out where that hiss is being uh, introduced into your signal chain or where the majority of it is, at least. So uh, do you need another wireless system? If so, which one? Well, <laughs> I would do that test first. Um, I would... I would okay. I would I would do this. Um, I think I think we've described everything. Is I can't really. I mean, you can go to the pro level wireless systems if you'd like to. It sounds like you've used um, you're using the wireless go right now, which is a consumer grade wireless system. It's not the cleanest in the world. It's it's okay, not but not amazing. Um, if you want something really really clean though, you're going to probably have to go up into the pro level. Uh, wireless gear and that's a lot more expensive much much thousands of dollars instead of a couple hundred or three hundred dollars so um, you have to decide if you really want to do that now you could potentially do some real-time uh noise reduction if it, but i would do that test first find out where it's where most of it's coming from and then let's talk again and we can make some decisions about you know some recommendations about what you could do next so thanks for that mirko mirko um Linda suggests you could use a noise plugin. Yes, if you're using, if you're, well, let's see, on the on the ATEM Mini Pro, there's a noise gate, or a, a, I don't love noise gates. They're not my favorite, but you could use that if you're, you know, if you're really, really sensitive to that and you want a, like a quick solution here. So that's one option. Um, noise assist on the Mix Pre is another option. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, in fact, I don't know if any of you know that, but at the, um, at the live stream, was it last week when we talked about microphone stands? That was last week, I think. Uh, I did actually use noise assist when I went out to the other studio. Um, there was a fan in the lights, two of the lights. And so I used a little bit of noise assist. I don't know if you could tell, um, but if you, <laughs> hopefully not, um, but it did, a, it seemed to do a pretty nice job and kept things nice and clean. So the, uh, it's called noise assist on the mix pre definitely worth a look but i would i would do that test still just to figure out where that hiss is being introduced yeah somebody just said the same thing and then the other main comment was cables are worth looking at as well yeah definitely cables as well again we'd have to we'd also know to have to understand where you're starting from um if you have a sample that you want to send over for next week um to give us a sample of where you're starting from, that'll help too. Because, you know, there's different levels of, of self-noise and where the noise floor sits, and um, that'll help to assess where we're at. So, all right, let's start there. We'll keep it going. Thank you, Mirko. All right, Andrew has a question. Uh, how to read the meters on the Mix Pre 3? When I monitor the meters, it looks as though I'm hitting minus 12 as a peak, but there is another little red line that is left at a higher level when the meters drop. Can you tell me what the little red line is indicating, please? Okay, yes. In fact, let's cut over to our overhead camera here. We have our mix pre, and I'm gonna do something real quick just to change a setting. Okay, we've got plenty of hiss in our room here, which is actually, in this case, not self, well, of course there's self noise of some sort, but that was a fan that I just turned off. All right, mix pre, you can see there is a little line. I think that's what you're referring to there, Andrew, is the little line that stays for just a couple of seconds in any spot. It varies between yellow, green, and red, depending on how high it goes. So if it goes up into above minus 12, it turns red. Uh, below that, it's yellow, and then even lower than that, it's green. So the important thing to understand on the mix pre meters is that those lines that, that stay there for about a second, those are the peak meters. So that is the highest amplitude that the sound has been for the last approximately one second. So that's what you want to do when you're setting your levels, is you want to watch that. So if that's going well above minus 12 and you're running into the limiters quite a bit, you probably want to gain down a little bit. And let me just demonstrate here. If I wanted to gain up here, this is probably too much. See, I'm hitting up against the limiters pretty regularly. 
that's probably gained up too high. Even though my bars are hitting about minus 12, I probably want to gain that back down. So let's go back down to 55 here, pop back out. That's a bit, that's probably a little bit closer to where I'd want to be. Now, what, what does that mean about the bars? So the thing about the bars is that with audio, the waveforms, um, well, audio is, first of all, sound is waves in the air. It's the molecules in the air moving back and forth. And that all happens, depending on the frequency, very, very quickly, faster than our eyes can really register if they actually had a meter that moved with every movement of the waveform. So what the meters are representing is the amplitude, how tall those waves are, or how much they're being displaced, if you will. And so the bars are actually kind of an average. So the peaks are being represented by the line, but the bars are representing more of an average over time. And so the, the thing that's useful about the bars is that that's going to be a little closer to how we hear. So that's going to represent, um, for example, you know, you, if you're, it will, it'll, yeah, it just, it just represents how we hear <laughs> and generally how loud things are going to be overall. But when you're setting your levels on a digital mixer or recorder like this, you're going to want to watch those peak levels to keep them at a reasonable level. So if you're aiming for minus 12, which I would generally do for things that are scripted and you know, there's not going to be, you know, massive changes in volume from your talent, then minus 12 is a great place to be. And um, the bars are going to give you are going to give you more of a kind of a, an average overall level of where things are. Um, so that's how I use those. Hopefully that makes some sense. Um, there's a much deeper conversation about uh, this. So basically, it's a VU meter, um, like an old school VU meter was a, the one with the little needle. Um, it was more of an average. And then the line is a peak meter. So it's a very, very sensitive one that shows us the tallest amplitude in the last several seconds. Okay, let's go back to the question here. Also, as I'm recording in an environment with some traffic noise, should I be trying to record as hot as possible, engaging the limiters often in order to maximize the signal to noise? And I would say no, <laughs> not, not, I mean, yes, maximize your signal to noise, but don't be hitting up against the limiters constantly. Limiters will, they're, they're a useful tool and they can help but if you're running up against them constantly, it, it's not going to sound great. So no, I would gain down some. And you can, you know, again, target something reasonable depending on the environment. But you should just be hitting those limiters every once in a while. Um, not more than every five seconds or so. I mean, that's just a, that's a shot in the dark number. It doesn't really mean anything. But if you're, you know, if you're hitting it like three times a second, then you're, you're getting too high. Um, so I would come down a little bit. And... Um, the nice thing about the mix pre is that you've got very clean preamplifiers, and so in post, it's okay to optimize those levels in post. You just want to get a clean recording. So I would, you know, again, depending on what you're recording, if it's spoken word and there's some traffic in the background, I would, again, still probably target minus 18 to minus 12 peak levels, and then you can optimize it in post. Probably closer to minus 12, generally. All right. And your final question, aside from risking clipping, is there any, any other drawbacks to this? Yeah, it just doesn't sound great if you're hitting that limiter constantly. So I would gain down just a touch. Again, keep, keep those peaks, that little line that stays there. Try and keep those around minus 12. Should be in good shape from there. Okay. Next up from Florian. I want to send audio from my MixPre 6.2 to a Sony FX9 or a Sony A6600. Good. Um, and set that up through tone. So we talked about this in, in actually most of our courses on audio recorders. We demonstrate how to do this. And Florian says, if I understand your video on that topic in your class correctly, you would set the trim gain on a camera to its lowest setting and rather increase the output level setting in the menu of the Mix Pre than the trim gain on the camera itself. Classic gain staging. Or would you do it differently? Well, um, first of all, for those that are not familiar, let's go to the Mac really quickly here, Danny. Um, the, the Sony FX9 is a cinema camera. Um, it's like a $11,000 camera, I think. Um, it has microphone inputs that are switchable between mic level and line level. So you're going to do it a little bit differently on this than you would on a Sony A6600, which is a smaller mirrorless consumer grade camera. 
Um, so let me just describe the two. So on the FX9, which you see here, you would set the input level to line instead of mic. You would set the trim to zero. And then you would send tone from your mix pre into the Sony FX9. Um, the tone will be at minus 20 dB, one kilohertz. Um, so the meters on the mix pre will show minus 20. And you're trying, you're aiming to have those meters on the FX9 also show minus 20. If they are not, then I would yes adjust the uh, output level on the mix pre to to match that so that they're matching. Okay, so that's how I would approach it. Now, let's come on back. So on the A6600, things are a little bit different. It does not. I don't believe it has a line level input. It is only a 3.5 millimeter microphone input. That's going to work a little bit differently. So in that case you are going to have to attenuate or turn down the output level on the mix pre to get that into the a6600 so again do the same thing turn on tone on the mix pre um, i would yes set the microphone input level on the a6600 to its lowest not off but lowest setting and then i would adjust the mix pre down until you're getting minus 20 on the a6600 meter and of course it will already be there on the mix pre so that's how I'd approach that. So they're going to be a little bit different because one has the ability to switch to line level. The other is a microphone level only camera. So hopefully that makes sense, Florian. Hopefully that clears things up for you. Okay. And that's all the questions that were submitted ahead of time. So we have some time to play around. Let's see what we have in the chat. And we can switch back over to uh, our main cam here. All right, a couple questions that came in early in the stream here. First from David, <clears throat> I'm thinking about recording into my Zoom F6 with wireless Sennheiser EW100G3 Love and then out to the camera with an attenuation cable. I know it's fairly simple and wondering your thoughts. Um, yeah, that should be great. One thing about the Zoom F6, um, depends on which version, which when you bought your Zoom F6, those that have been purchased within the last year, roughly, um, didn't really require an attenuation cable. So if you bought it before that, you may need that attenuation cable. If you bought it after that, you may not. The reason I say that is um, we had, I bought one of the first ones. And the problem with it is that if you turn the output level down in the F6, the output level just gets really, really noisy, like ridiculously noisy. So what you had to do instead is use an attenuation cable to get the output level much lower. And again, this is a camera that only has, a, for cameras that only have microphone level inputs, if you're going to a camera that has a line level input, it's not a problem. Just leave the output level on the Zoom F6 at its, you know, at zero, which is essentially line level, and that will, that'll be clean and no problem. But if you have a camera that only has a microphone input, then you're going to have to get that level down from, from the Zoom F6. If you have one of the older versions, you'll need an attenuation cable somewhere around minus, at least minus 25. Usually works pretty well. Minus 35 is probably ideal. Um, and then, yeah, that should work fine. No problem. I would ask this, though. Um, the, the main advantage, the real... Mm -hmm. I don't know that having the F6 in that signal chain is going to get you a lot unless you have some other microphones coming in as well. Because here's the thing, the, the G3 already has its own preamplifier in it. And it sends out a mic level signals that you could take directly into your camera. So I'm not, I'm not entirely clear on why you're using the Zoom F6 in there as well. And maybe you're doing a backup recording. However, keep in mind that the Zoom F6 recording in 32-bit float is only going to be able to capture all of the dynamic range without clipping if you don't clip on the G3. So <laughs> that one's a tricky one. So um, anyway, lots of considerations there. You could potentially just take your G3 directly into camera. If not, uh, if you do want to go through the F6 still, then yeah, your setup sounds like it should be fine. If you have a newer Zoom 6 as of about a year ago, um, you may not even need that attenuation cable. I would do a test turn the output level down into the camera and see how noisy it is. If it's clean, then you're good to go. If it's, if it is sounding really, really noisy, then you may need that attenuation cable. So hopefully that helps, David. I know it was more complex than you probably wanted, but hopefully it's helpful. 
Okay, next up. My interface has balanced line outputs, and the device I want to send signals to uses combo XLR TRS balanced inputs. What's the best practice? TRS on both ends or TRS to XLR? Um, I mean, I think either is going to be fine. Um, personally, I prefer XLR, but TRS is going to be just fine as well. Um, it's balanced, so it should be just great. The only thing with the balanced, with the... Yeah, it, it, in that case, I don't think it's going to make a difference. Either one is fine. And then continued, can I use leftover Canary L4E6S star quad cable for making TRS cables? I assume that shouldn't be a problem. Just want to make sure. Absolutely. If it hasn't been damaged in any way, it'll be it'll be fantastic cabling. So yeah, it should be fine. Oh, yes, by the way, <laughs> we have this pinned at the top of the chat, but if you missed the dialogue at Mixmaster Challenge on Thursday, we do have the link for it here. It was a fantastic session with Austin Olivia Kendrick, Mike Delgadio, and Bandrew Scott. And of course, um, <laughs> we had originally also invited Alan Williams to join us. He was not sure whether he was going to have to work, so we went ahead without him. But he ended up not working, so he is also in the chat, uh, making all sorts of noise and wreaking havoc there. Um, but it was a fun time, and uh, we really... I think there were some really great insights from our panelists. So if you didn't get a chance to see that would, um, and you're interested, there is the link for it there. Thanks, Danny, for bringing that up. I think you answered this, but this is right at the beginning. Matt asks, a uh, question on the signal chain. How are you sending from the ATEM Extreme to the Epifan Pearl Nano? HDMI, I'm assuming, anything to know? I'm setting up one next week. Yes. Um, so we're using the HDMI output on the ATEM Mini, and then that's going into a cross converter the, in this case, a decimator 12G cross. So HDMI into that cross converter, SDI out, because we're making a fairly long run of cable over into the next room. And then that goes in SDI into the Pearl Nano. So that's what we have set up right here. Yeah, so out of the ATEM Extreme, um, we're sending it via HDMI. Just one of the, it has two HDMI outputs in the ATEM software. We just set it to program and that's what gets sent over to the Pearl Nano. So hopefully that helps. And good luck uh, on your gig next week, Matt. Camille, thanks so much for the super chat and thanks for being a part of the community. It's great to have you here. And also, Mirko, thank you so much for your question. Um, let us know how things go. Let's follow up too. If we've got we've got live streams each week, so let us know how your testing goes, what you found out, and if you need further help, definitely come on back and let's let's help you get where you need to be. Shoji, did you ever figure out the streaming problem you were having with the A10 Mini Pro? No, um, I have not. I have not tested again since probably February, so I haven't I haven't messed with it, but um, haven't figured it out. So I'm just using the happily using <laughs> the Epifan Pearl Nano instead with flawless results in terms of never had any issues like we had with the encoder on the A10 Mini Extreme. So that's good news for us. Leon, uh, Leon from the UK here, love your work. Question, what is the best tool to remove hiss in RX-9? Uh, well, it depends on the situation. There are a variety of options. And in fact, I can, give me just a moment here to pop up. Do I even have RX here on the bar? I don't. Just one second here. Okay, let's pop over to the Mac here. There are a few different options here. There's a uh, spectral denoise. There is voice denoise. There, and if you're, it depends on which version of RX you have. So this is the advanced version here. There is dialogue isolate. Um, and depending on the, again the nature of the hiss or the, if it's a hum, there's also a dehum. Uh, so there are lots of different options. <laughs> Generally, for for just kind of low level hiss, uh, depending on what you're doing, I think that the denoise, uh, spectral denoise, or the voice denoise. Voice denoise is a little easier to use, but the spectral denoise allows you to kind of get in and really kind of tune things a little bit more. So we do have an RX course if you want to go into the details on that, but uh, these are some of the, these are probably the three tools that you would go to. I would start probably with the voice denoise. And one tip when you're doing it, generally I would, you start with a threshold at zero, 
I would do the reduction at no more than 6 dB. And if you still feel like there's noise even after that, you can do another pass, but don't just crank. I wouldn't normally just crank this up. Um, you can do tw up to 20 dB of attenuation on a single pass. Instead, I would be much more modest and do somewhere between three and six, and then reevaluate and see how it's working. Um, some things too, I would, if you're, if you're doing, if you're cleaning dialogue, make sure you select optimize for dialogue. I generally use the gentle filter type. It can't, it doesn't remove quite as much noise, but generally results in fewer artifacts with dialogue. So those are some thoughts on that. So good question. I think to the laws there. Okay. Nick says, one thing I've noticed uh, is that the digital systems in general can seem to have a higher noise floor if someone is used to a good analog wireless because the compounding can hide the self noise of the mic. Good point, Nick. Yes. Um, especially the consumer wireless, uh, digital wireless. So that's going to be anything like the Rode Wireless Go, anything that's that's working in 2.4 gigahertz. Um, interesting point there, Nick. Thanks so much for sharing that. All right, why don't we go back to our main cam here. Uh, Ted says, I had what seemed like a lot of hiss when recording with my Shure SM7B. I think it was due to all the gain I had to add when listening back to a recording thought it seemed negligible. So another thing to keep in mind too is that the headphone amplifier that you're using when you're monitoring during recording can be adding its own self noise. So don't, you have to be careful as well. When you're listening back and trying to evaluate for hiss, make sure you're using a really high quality playback system that doesn't have a lot of its own self noise that it's generating. So um, you'll find that especially on, on some rec recorders. Um, some of them have better pre or headphone amplifiers than others. And so, for example, the Zoom headphone amplifiers tend to be a little bit noisier in my experience than the Mix Pre does. Mix Pre is not perfect, um, but it's not quite as noisy as the Zoom recorders. So something to keep in mind. Okay, cool. Thank you, Danny. <laughs> Another question. How does the Sennheiser MKH 8040 compare to the 8050, MKH 50, Neumann 185 for indoor spoken word? It's the easiest for me to obtain at the moment. Well, I've never used the MKH 40, so I don't, 8040, I don't have firsthand experience with it. Um, but let me just pull it up here, Sennheiser, and let's do a search. Yes, you can, you can find, yes, you're going to use cookies. <laughs> um, MKH 8040, I believe that's a cardioid. Uh, ba, ba, ba. It's the cardioid version of um, good grief. Got enough of that. Oh, I didn't want to go to the warranty information. I just wanted the product information. Yeah, I think it's a. This is just basically the cardioid version. Yeah, it's cardioid. So it's very much. It's going to be very very similar to the eighty fifty. Um, in terms of sound is my guess. I haven't, again, I haven't worked with it firsthand, so I don't know. Um, I would generally, for indoors, for boom mic applications, I often, I generally prefer a super cardioid polar pattern uh, just to get a little bit more focus. Um, but the 8040, I'm sure, could work as well. Again, if you're going to be able to get it close, then I think that should be a fine option as well. It's just going to have a wider polar pattern. It's going to be a wider pickup on the front potentially a little bit better at rejecting from the back. So that's just kind of the general nature of cardioid versus super cardioid. Hopefully that answers your question. Well, actually, let's go back to the question. There were some other mics listed there as well. Um, MKH50. I... <laughs> Uh, MKH50 is this one is this mic that has this amazing reputation, and it is a good mic. We use it at work all the time. Um, I would just be careful. It does have a little bit more character to it, if you will. Well, these all have character to them. They're not perfectly neutral, but um, the 50 to me sounds a little bit more mid-forward, a little bit more uh, like there's a little bit of a bump in the middle, and that with certain voices like my own and many others it can start to sound pretty harsh so you may have to do a little bit of eq uh, the 8050 tends to be a little bit more forgiving on that front i have not used the neumann 185 so i'm really not sure on that one so anyone that has experience with those in the chat would love to hear your input as well 
Uh, there you go. Uh, Kevin mentions OBS includes a good limiter, and I agree. the The trick with the with OBS is that the, that's a digital limiter. So the only thing you want to keep in mind there is that you'll still want to make make sure that you're coming in with plenty of headroom and not bumping up against the limiter. Then, whenever you do any, you can do processing in OBS and then use that OBS limiter to manage those levels. So that's where the OBS limiter comes in really handy. If you're clipping on your input, whatever you're using, if you're using a microphone into an audio interface and you're clipping there then the OBS limiter won't help you. But if you make sure you're coming in to OBS cleanly with no clipping, then you do some additional processing, maybe some compression and uh, makeup gain, and then apply that OBS limiter, that can be really helpful as well. So thanks for that, Kevin, and good to hear from you. Hope you're doing well. Ted, cables away from power, although I think that typically introduces hum and under over coiling or wrapping of cables. I'm not sure the context of this one, but... The noise. Oh, from the noise, yeah. Definitely keep your cables away from any AC adapters in particular, but also power cables. Uh, usually that is going to be a little bit more a hum type thing than a hiss. Um, over under coiling or wrapping of cables, that's going to just help the cables uh, last longer and, not, and, and be less likely to experience damage, and which can result in things like hiss and crackling and, and all, all sorts of things like that. So yeah, all good good practices for sure, Ted. Smack me silly. Adjust to the peak meter, not the sound level. <laughs> uh, no need to smack silly. Always learning. Thank you for coming back. It's great to have you here and to have, to, um, to have your sense of humor is really delightful as well. Thank you so much. Matt says, what's the best way to get audio into the ATEM Extreme? Soundboard, Roadcaster, Mix Pre 62, or marry it later in post? I would prefer not to do it in post. Can't take it into camera yet. Um, well, if you're doing it live, you've got to get the sound somehow in there. So I, well, usually I do, as, as you saw here, I'm doing it through the camera. You don't have that option, it looks like then I would probably take the Mix Pre 6.2 into the ATEM Mini's uh, line input is what I would probably do. Soundboard is the same thing. So soundboard is going to have to come into the ATEM as well, and it'll come in that line input. So that's going to be the same. Same with the Roadcaster. Roadcaster, um, not as optimal. Um, the, the line output on that is really made for monitors, and it's not true. It's not plus four dBU line level, it's a little bit lower than that. So then you're going to have to boost the gain on the ATEMS input, which is not the cleanest in the world. So I'd go with the Mix Pre or a soundboard and then bring those one of those in line level into the ATEM Mini. And good luck again on the gig. Uh, Daniel, are you planning to update the Fairlight course now that Resolve 18 has been released? Yes. So we have we have a lot of things in mind. I don't have a date on that yet because there's I have to take you know some time off of work to get enough focus time to do that. Um, but now that we have Emma on as an associate producer, we definitely need to come back and update that. We need to come back and update the Mix Pre course with some new firmware updates. Um, the Zoom F8 course we need to come and update with the Zoom F8 M Pro capabilities. Um, so yeah, there'll definitely be some revisit on that and I'll keep you up to date when that's done and ready to go. I was wondering if that tone method would be the same for, say, a Fujifilm or Panasonic mirrorless camera. Absolutely yes. Exact same. So you're just trying to get the levels calibrated between the recorder mixer and the camera itself. And the idea there is that so that, um, like, if you had the levels coming in too hot to the camera, then even if you're not clipping in your audio recorder or mixer, it could clip the camera. So if you get them both to minus 20 on their meters, that's going to drastically reduce the risk of um, OK levels coming in on the mixer, clipping the camera, if that makes sense. So you're just getting them at the same level so that the levels carry at the same same level throughout the entire signal chain. So yes, definitely work on both. Panasonic, Fujifilm, any camera brand, doesn't matter. All right, Mark, the XF605 has input one attenuation. Is this like a pad? P.S. It has it also has a limiter, but that was switched off. So yeah, I would turn that pad on and do some tests. And what you can do, Mark, is you can actually set up your camera 
with the same setup, put it in front of a speaker and crank the speaker <laughs> to roughly the levels that you were experiencing at the venue and do some testing that way. So yeah, that's I think that is probably like a pad. The trick is, is that you ideally want to apply the pad at the microphone. I don't, I doubt it's the microphone that's clipping. It could be, I don't know for sure. In fact, if I go to road.com, again, um, shotgun microphones are not necessarily like the ideal for recording in those circumstances, recording music. Here it is, MTG3. We're going to look at the specs. Uh, maximum sound pressure level, 130 dB SPL. So that's got a, a pretty good max input level. So I'm doubtful that that's what's actually clipping, but unless you had it really close to the speakers, the loudspeakers for the venue. Um, but yeah, I would, I would do some testing there. Yes, turn on the attenuation and see what you get. Interesting that the limiters were already off. Um, kind of looked like it was being limited. I don't know what, what was going on there. But uh, yeah, do that test. Also, don't be afraid to contact Canon support. Um, these camera manufacturers need to support their cameras. If you're still having trouble with it, I would get in touch with them as well and see what you can get sorted there. Andreas, or Andre, excuse me, would you consider to be a good idea to convert my GeForce to SMA antennas? Um, if you're, if you, if you've got a lot of DIY spirit in you, by all means, um, then you can kind of tune things as far as, you know, using different frequencies. Although the whip antennas they put on there should be good for the entire frequency range that the system could handle. So that just makes it replaceable, I guess. I don't know if there are other advantages to doing that, but yeah, if you know how to solder and um, you feel confident, uh, go for it. I think that's going to, if it's still under warranty, the warranty is going to be gone after you do that, just FYI. But um, yeah, it could be a fine choice. All right, Sonoga asked, how's the performance of the Nano? I assume you're referring to the Epiphan Pearl Nano. We did a review of that in 2021. So if you go to my main channel and do a search of Pearl Epiphan, sorry, Epiphan Pearl Nano, you'll see that. Uh, the Nano is rock solid. I've never had any issues with it uh, whatsoever. It's not, it doesn't, it's not as, it's not the same type of device that the ATEM minis are. It's a different thing. It only has a couple of inputs, so you're not going to have the ability to switch lots of different sources, but it's been really, really reliable. Now, another thing about it is it's noisy. It has a fan in it, <laughs> so you probably want to have it uh, away from the microphones if you're going to be live streaming just yourself. So that's another thing to keep in mind as well. But in terms of reliability, it has been top notch for me. Matt, thanks for the super chat. Thanks. All my installs are all my installs are normally more high end. This is for a ministry, and the budget was low for me. I it was so low I had to supplement it myself. I've only used Blackmagic 4K switchers, not the ATEM. Okay, yeah, the bigger ATEMs are kind of a different game. Understood, but yeah, this this one, uh, you may you're going to want to have some cross converters on hand. Probably that's that's the trick with when you're doing it in a venue where you have to do longer cable runs. Um, SDI is is far superior to, to HDMI when it comes to that. So, um, so having those cross converters and being able to run longer swaths of cable with uh, or longer lengths of cable with SDI is going to be really really helpful. All right, three questions. I really appreciate the feedback on my sample from the crew. I'm going to, uh, back to the drawing board and kind of gutting my audio path. This is referring to the Dialogue Edit Mixmaster Challenge. Uh, it'd be great to hear from you and or some soundies on the before and after and maybe some further tweaks. I wasn't provided with many specifics by the panel except the feeling that I'm probably over-processing. I think that's the biggest thing, Ted, as uh, we kind of saw that as a theme. Um, a lot of us are over-processing. <laughs> um, and so that's uh that's definitely a theme that we saw there and, and that's not a bad place to start so specifics wise i would keep it sim pretty simple you know just listen to what you have from the start and before you do anything i would identify very clearly in your own mind or even write it down what are the specific issues that you hear and articulate those and then just address those 
don't try to use all the tools that are possibly available out there just because I've talked about them before or anything like that. Just ignore me for a little while. What you're really trying to do is address the problems that you actually hear and only use the tools you need to address those. That's probably the best um, way to approach this. What happens a lot of times is we, we talk about all these different tools that you can use. You don't have to use all of them. And in fact, you shouldn't use all of them unless you need them. So the idea is, even when I do product reviews, I want people to know that, is that just because I review a, a piece of gear doesn't mean I'm saying everyone should have this. It's really about, are you trying to solve a problem that this particular piece of equipment can help you solve? And if so, here's my evaluation of it. So, and it's the same thing with any software processing, any analog processing gear. For the live stream here, is this the cleanest in the world? No, there's, you you, can all, you all can hear noise in this room, right? I mean, there's, there's a fan in the A10 Mini. It's kind of a growly fan, actually. There was a fan in the camera that I turned off just a few minutes ago. There's just general room noise, um, you know, general tone of the room. Nothing is perfectly silent, so I don't do any noise reduction. It's offensive to some people, perhaps, but <laughs> but I think you, you have to kind of draw a line, too, at some point and say, look, this is... The risk of over-processing is very real as well, and so you want to make sure you balance making things better versus going too far. So definitely a lesson learned for me in, in listening to the panel and what they had to contribute to all of the different things that we looked at as well. I, I've, I go back to my older videos and look at the, and listen to them. And the deep breath plugin from RX is just a bear to get that set right. And it, a lot of them you can obviously hear in my older videos. Um, and actually not even that long ago. So I'm going to, I'm kind of reevaluating how I approach that. And I either need to get better at using that deep breath plugin, or I need to stop using it and find another way to address the breaths in between. So I'm with you, Ted. Hang in there. Teacher, teachers, thank you for the super chat. The pandemic has been challenging, but meanwhile, I got two years of life-changing audio education at a killer price <laughs> for free. <laughs> I'm glad it's been helpful for you, Dave, and I'm really glad that you're, you know, you're, you're here as part of the community. I think it's uh, having this has been a really good thing for me as well, just keeping the perspective on the up and up. Um, so thanks for being a part of that as well. Andre, also, how would you remove law of interference from audio? What do you mean by law of interference? Do you mean clothing rustle? Do you mean um, RF interference on a wireless system? Do you mean self noise like hiss? I guess it depends. So I obviously all three of those would be treated in a different way. Camille, uh, professional lavaliers, DPA sync, and et cetera, often have a flat mid rangey sound. Do the manufacturers assume that you will still apply EQ in uh, to yourself to make it sound really nice? I Yeah, I think, I mean, those lavaliers are, are designed to get, oftentimes they actually, they're not necessarily just mid rangey They also emphasize the high frequencies quite a bit because oftentimes they're made for hiding under clothing and the clothing will attenuate some of the high frequencies before they even get to the microphone. So they they often tune them for those purposes. So that's important to keep in mind. Um, yeah, I think I, from my point, oh, our LEDs, we're, we're done. No more color in the background for this, this round. <laughs> I forgot to charge them up yesterday. I did a three hour long uh, work session yesterday and I forgot to charge those are little Aperture MCs, the little um, battery powered LED lights. And I, I thought I saw one flash a little while ago, but it's still a color and now it, the other one has gone out. So about, uh, let's see, four, three hours and 50 minutes is what I got battery time on those. Pretty good. Um, in any case, yeah, I, I think that we're looking at... Um, definitely add some EQ to tune them. And that's going to be for a couple of reasons. Number one, to make them sound great. Number two, to cut between a lavalier microphone and a boom microphone. You're also going to have to do some EQ to make them sound fairly similar to each other so that it's not really obvious to the audience that you've cut between them. So I think the answer to that is yes, they are anticipating that. Ted, 
Can't calling a cable introduce a magnetic field and hum? Um, power cables, certainly. I thought that was an additional reason for over-under wrapping. Um, with audio cables, it, it yeah, well, unbalanced cables, potentially. I don't, I've never had that problem with balanced cables. And again, what, what's flowing through balanced audio cables or even unbalanced audio cables is such a low um, voltage that I don't think you're really at a major risk of creating an electromagnetic field um, from just that. So I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so. But, I mean, if you want to straighten it out, and, and you, can, you can always do that and do it as a test. Definitely worth a test. Everything's worth a test to see what you get. Nowadays, would you buy a used sound device of 633 or a MixPre 102? Hmm. Depends on what you're doing. Um, depends entirely on what you're doing. They don't sound a whole lot different. The mix they have different preamplifiers, no doubt. Um, they have the cashmere preamps on the Mix Pre 2. The 633 has um, the 6 series preamplifiers, so they sound a little different. They have a slightly warmer low end on the 633, but it's not huge. It's, you have to listen to them right next to each other to even hear a difference. Um, yeah, so it really depends on what you're doing. If you have a lot of... Gosh, that's a tough question. If you also were going to get some professional wireless systems and you wanted the slot system that goes with... I think there's a slot system one with a 633, a two-slot. I can't remember. Maybe not. Maybe it was only for the 688. I don't know. I, at the time, I wasn't using a slot system when I had my 633. Um... But again, I guess it depends on what you're trying to do. Um, if you are doing production sound, then probably I'd go with a 633. If you are, like if, if you're trying to make that your career, then probably a 633 makes sense. If you are doing a lot of different things um, and it's not necessarily a career mix pre 10, although I've done, I've used a mix pre on professional uh, things. What it was, the Orange County Choppers, they were doing a, a series and they came out to Utah and I ended up using, I had my 633, but I also had a mix pre 10. They ended up wanting so many wire, uh, channels of wireless that I ended up having to switch over to the mix pre. Um, that was a 10 T that wasn't the mix pre 10 too. Uh, so I just needed the inputs at that point. I guess that's another question. How many inputs do you need? 633 has three mic inputs and then three additional line inputs. So, um, that's a consideration. You can get a, a max of six channels going in there. If you need more than that, the Mix Pre 10 to could be an advantage. So, okay. Tom, I'm interested in what work you're getting recently. TV, short films, corporate, and what's your favorite? Um, I have, I am doing all corporate at this point on day job, all day job stuff. So we are shooting educational videos for a company called Webflow. You can find them on YouTube, us on YouTube. Um, we working primarily in a studio Every, periodically, we do some walk and talk type shoots or filming sessions, but almost all within a studio educational, um, education is probably my favorite. I think, I, I mean, I've worked on some short films. Um, I've done some things that have gone to a few things that have gone to TV that that was the Orange County Choppers thing or American Chopper or whatever that show is called. <laughs> I should probably know. <laughs> um, but short films are a lot of fun. Um, but day to day, I'm doing I'm doing the education. Corporate is, is really broad. Corporate can mean so many different things. Um, there are a lot of a lot of corporate video really in my mind is like marketing content video. And I don't do that. Not really. I mean, it can be fun. I haven't done a lot of it. Not really my thing. Um, but that's a, that's a valid path as well, of course. And I have friends that, that have done plenty of that. I've got, um, yeah, plenty of contacts, but yeah, we're doing education video, which in itself is a challenge, um, and a lot of fun as well. We try to add some humor. Linda says, does anyone know about the best way to sell G3 sets uh, that are in the 600 megahertz range? It's not legal where I am. eBay? Um, I guess I don't know off the top of my head, but there may be some locales where or some countries where 600 megahertz is still available. So I would try to find that out. And what you might do, Linda, is call Gotham Sound and just see what, see, just ask them that exact question, see what they suggest. Um, yeah. 
best of luck on that. Ted, uh, your noise floor sounds really low and good to me. Well, good. That's good enough uh, then because <laughs> it's not perfect. Um, this microphone has some self noise. Let's see what the let's see what the spec is on the Earthworks Ethos. Danny um, laughs a little bit at, at Earthworks um, just because she's a geologist and paleontologist, and I think for her that the uh, it sounds like like uh, something that should be geology related or at least construction related. <laughs> Yeah. Geophone. Um, where would they be? Under vocal mics? Probably. SR314, SV33. Nope. Sorry for the... Let's go to speech. Here we go. Let's go to podcasting mics. Ethos. Let's check and see what the self-noise specification is on this. I'm going to do page down, but I don't have page down. Do I have page down here? Yes, I do. Okay. I'm trying to reduce the overall movement here here are some specifications okay we are looking for equivalent input noise self noise 16 db that is not low that is not a low self noise specification there um but we're managing the noise in the room as best we can. So again, at this point, we just have the A10 minis fan plus whatever room ambiance there is. So, but yeah, it's uh, it's a challenge. It's it's always a challenge. And we do have, the, this helps a ton. Have, having something that absorbs sound keeps it from reflecting all over, that's gonna make a big difference. It's not the same as noise, um, but the reflected sound is what tends to be really kind of jarring for to listen to, especially for longer periods of time. Okay, Andre, uh, you're talking about RF interference. Um, yeah, that's why you've got to be monitoring. You need to, There, it's not easy to remove RF interference. Um, depending on how it comes in, you're probably going to have to do some spectral denoising if you do have that and you don't have any other way to do a re record on that. So yeah, that's not an ideal situation. I would, I would use the spectral denoise if that's the only option you have. Otherwise, that's why it's important to be monitoring during the recording and stop things and fix it on the recording spot so that you don't have to bring, you know, deal with that issue in post. And that's a that's a long discussion about how to do that in spectral denoise too. It depends on the RF interference as well. All right. Uh, Diesel 10, thanks for the super chat. Any audio interfaces that'll work with a Chromebook? I would assume that a Chromebook could work with uh, something like a, a Scarlet 2i2, I would assume. Does anyone else out there know? I don't have a Chromebook, so I don't know for certain, but I would expect that it would work with a, like a two-channel audio interface should work fine. Anything like a, anything that's class compliant. So anything like a Scarlet 2i2, a Mo2 M2. Um, those are probably the first two that come to my mind that I've used. And if you've got any other suggestions in the chat, definitely let our friend Diesel10 know. Thoughts on the Roadcaster Pro 2? Uh, thanks for that, Michael. Yes, definitely. So we've got one on pre-order. Um, I would love, it looks like Rode is making kind of a platform that's upgradable. They can add stuff to it. I'd love to see them add some sort of auto mix feature to it. I, I hope they're listening. I'm going to be making a review on it. I have mine on pre-order. Um, as soon as I get that in, of course, I'll be uh, covering that. Probably the thing I'm most excited about in the Roadcaster is the Compeller, which is a speech volume leveler. Um, Aphex is a company that's been around for a long time. I think they're actually part of the Rode uh, umbrella of businesses at this point. And they've made this Compeller for a long time. It's been around, I think, for a couple decades, I think. Um, but basically, its job is to level speech volume. So it's a little bit more sophisticated than just a, a regular compressor. Um, works in kind of a different way, but it's an interesting option that's included, as I understand it, in the Roadcaster Pro 2. So that's the thing that I'm most excited to try out. Um, also excited, of course, that the preamps have been redesigned. So you shouldn't need to push things so hard when you're using dynamic microphones like an SM7B. So that's a nice step forward. Those are probably kind of the highlights for me. So more to come on that. 
Darren, any experience suggestions running XLR audio over Shielded Cat 6? I have not done that. Um, I would take a look at uh, Dave Rat has a channel on YouTube. I know he's he's actually got a, a company where he actually makes things along those lines, so I'm sure he has some advice on that. That's the first place I'd check. Um, Watson Wu also talked about that recently. He does some long runs every once in a while, long cable runs where he'll go over Cat 6. So the thing I... Ass- uh, yeah, so anyway, those are the two sources I would look at. I don't have any suggestions on my uh, from first-hand experience on that. All right, Proximal Memoir. Hi, Curtis. Uh, what do you think? Uh, what you do is invaluable. Thank you. Working on a short now. Undoubtedly, some of the workflow is happening more smoothly due to your videos. All the best. So glad to hear it. I, I hope you're the best on your short film. And... Um, those are those are the best experiences. To, you learn so much doing those kind of things. So best of luck on that. Looking forward to hearing how it comes out. Teacher of teachers, here's a question for anyone. Has anyone posted a nice video on how to roll up cables? I find this simple task very challenging and got the evil eye at our local public access station over this. Yes, sound speeds. Uh, recently posted one. Yep, he did a bit over a month ago. Yeah, it was just within the last few weeks here. Uh, that's where I would go as well. He goes through it in great detail, and he there's I've never seen anyone be uh, wrap a cable as fast as Alan Williams on sound speeds. <laughs> so yeah, agreed with that as well. Harry, are you going to review the new Tentacle Sync product? I can't remember off cuff what it is. A Track E Mark II. Oh, I haven't heard about it. So let's take a look right now. See what we've got. Let's go to Tentacle Sync dot com uh let's see let's go to products i have the tracky which i've already reviewed the sinky i reviewed the original i reviewed um i don't see anything new on the channel here but i if you're looking at the tracky which is the 32-bit float recorder i did do a review of that already um it's okay yeah it's okay it's, um, I'm not a huge, huge fan of um, body pack recorders. They're, they're a tool that's useful in certain circumstances, but I don't use them a lot. Um, but they can be the right tool for a job. If, if you know, if things are going to get crazy in terms of wireless connectivity, they can do a job there. But um, yeah, that one's, it's decent, I would say. The mic that comes with it is just okay, not amazing. Um, but otherwise, it's a fine recorder. I'm not sure if there's another one that I missed. Maybe there's a new announcement that they don't have on their on their site yet. Um, oh yeah, this is in regards from Matt uh, the Rodecaster Pro Two. Better preamps, better headphone amps, two USB out and USB power. Very good. Yeah, the two USB out's interesting. Um, I wonder if it can act. That's to me that's interesting. It's kind of mind bending how it can be a host to two separate devices at the same time, which is that's interesting. Um, I don't have a lot of use cases for that, but that's an interesting thing. USB power, I know they added kind of as an add-on to the original Rodecaster Pro. So you do have to have a power delivery um, USB battery bank if that's what you're using. So you do have to watch the specs on the battery bank. But yeah, that's that's great. Better headphone amps would be nice as well, um, for sure. So yeah, some good things there. Matt, thanks for that. Uh, okay, Tentacle Sync has, an, has a Sync E with Bluetooth 5, I believe. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, I thought the Sync E already had... Oh, okay, it was a previous version of Bluetooth, most likely. That makes sense. Cool. Uh, Matt got my Allen Sound Speeds cables coming in Tuesday for this install gig. Very good. Yes, those cables should treat you well. Okay, this is the last one. And this is the last one, Danny says. Sorry if I missed your thoughts on this somewhere, but... How are you finding the U87 since you've gotten to use it? Uh, the U87, the Neumann U87 large diaphragm condenser microphone is a staple in a lot of music recording studios. I think it's a fantastic microphone. Straight into the recorder uh, or into the DAW recording my voice, it's not a great fit. It does need a little bit of EQ, but that's the beautiful thing about it. It can be EQ'd. It captures everything nicely, so you can you can tune it and sculpt it to the voice that's that's singing or speaking into it. So it's a fine microphone. Is it worth thirty two hundred dollars U.S. or whatever the price is? 
I think you can get really good results with a much less expensive microphone, to be honest. But it's um, I the reason I bought it was as a reference so that when I'm doing other microphone reviews, I have that to refer to um, and to compare to. Um, but yeah, with some EQ, it's a beautiful, beautiful sounding mic straight into the recorder. You'll notice that. In fact, if you want to hear it on the review I posted on my main channel today, the review of the IK Multimedia iRig Pro Quattro IO, which is a mouthful of a name for a product. <laughs> um, that one was all recorded with the U87 with no EQ. So you can hear exactly what that sounds like. So if you're curious, um, but overall, um, I think that you can achieve a great spoken word recording with a much like a Rode NT1 is a fantastic microphone from my point of view on almost every voice. And if you do have to do a little bit of EQ with that, you can do that as well. So those are some thoughts on that. Thanks for the question. All right, let's go ahead and wrap for today. Thanks everyone for being a part of the live stream today. Hope you get a chance to work on some of your sound projects this week. Get out there and make some great sound and we'll talk to you again soon. Take care, everybody.